And thank you very much for joining us here on PM Express. And we are counting down to a very important moment in this country's aviation history. Um, never in our history, I guess, have we shut down the airport for so long to all manner of flights coming into the country. But we did so because of a pandemic that hit the globe, the COVID-19 pandemic. But in the next few hours, the airport is going to be reopening. There is a lot that has to happen to make that opening successful, especially um, since we are getting used to these new COVID-19 protocols as we open these borders. There's a lot, a lot of moving parts that we need to get through for you. And I know there are thousands, millions of you who watch the show from abroad who have gotten in touch with us over the months yearning to return to Ghana when the borders open. And that is why tonight we have deliberately tried to get hold of the aviation minister himself so he can break down the issues for you wherever you are. And for those of you who live in the jurisdiction, I know you have families out there uh, across the world who are waiting to hear uh, some clarity and break these issues down so you can facilitate their uh, traveling back into Ghana. And that's why today you need to stay with us because we try and get all the clarity for you here on uh, PM Express. Now, we know that the reopening has been, uh, has been uh, one that the preparations have been going on for a while. The Kotuka International Airport, we know, uh, is going to be uh, the key focus for many of the airlines uh, going forward. Ghana's landing sea borders remain shut, we know until further notice the president announced uh, when of course he addressed the nation yesterday government says it will subject the passengers to strict and thorough examination before allowing them into the country but there are specifics to this officials explain that the measures put in place should significantly minimize the importation of the virus into the country one of the key things remember that remember when we go back to march we got coronavirus into this country mainly primarily at least from the testing through the Kotoka International Airport, and that is one of the critical areas to guard going forward. But what do we know of the measures? Uh, the managing director of the Ghana Airport Company today has outlined steps that will be undertaken if you are arriving in country tomorrow. Passengers will be given fresh face masks. In fact, the airlines themselves will have to comply with this as you, as you disembark and, and get on the stairs. You must be wearing uh, that. And so keep, keep in mind if you want to travel back into Ghana, some of these things are important. The test uh, fee is uh, $150 if you arrive. We, the president says this will take uh, 30 minutes to get the results. And so this is key. You disembark, you go to the process. By the time you end the process, your results should be ready uh, 30 minutes. If this is indeed one of the key things that government has uh, been touting today, uh, we're going to be asking a few clarity for you. Uh, the cost element has come up as well. Those of you who have been stranded for so long say you've spent all your money waiting for the borders to be opened. Uh, you probably can't afford $150. Can government do anything about it? We'll hear the aviation minister on that. There's also strict enforcement of social distancing and other protocols uh, on the ground once you arrive here in, in Ghana. Uh, pets are not allowed, by the way. Now, another key thing I need to emphasize, before you arrive in the country, you must have done a PCR test in the last 72 hours and you, it must be negative and when you arrive the president says then you go through this the second test of the that, that takes 30 minutes so get some clarity on that also for you some are asking so if i did a pcr test why then do i need another test just within a 72 um, hour turnaround period we'll get the aviation minister to explain why that was critical uh, for you Passengers to arrive at least four hours before flight. And this is for you if you're going to use the Kotoka to travel, arrive early. I cannot overemphasize that point. I travel all the time and I get I arrive the 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and I'm rushing through. The protocols have changed. So do not be like me because trust me, if you go there an hour or even two hours before time, you miss your flight. So this is why that's why this show is so important for you. Four hours, because you'll be tested. If you're traveling, it's an international rule now. You cannot sit on an airplane without that test result. That's key. Passengers who are not traveling and have no business at the terminal, please stay away. This now is it's a health issue. Um, you know, Ghanaians, we like, you know, accompanying our people to travel, but please bear that in mind. Don't crowd the area. Social distancing is key. The cost of the test has come up. We'll try and get clarity for you also tonight. The Deputy Health Minister has explained why they wanted on 50 
um, dollars is the cost of the test. You remember that if you arrive in this country before you're doing quarantine, you're going to spend 14 days in a hotel. He says, well, if you're going to spend 14 days in a hotel, you're going to pay far more than $150. But if you pay $150 to get your results in 30 minutes, you just simply go home. Um, that, I guess, is the explanation why this is so. But there may be other factors also that we'll get to hear from the uh, aviation minister uh, tonight. So I wanted to stay with me. The aviation minister is with me. It is uh, Mr. Uh, Joseph Adam. My, my, I'm grateful that you could join me, sir. Uh, thank you very much for joining me. I'm going to take my seat and I'm going to start with the fundamental question that everybody is asking tonight, which is, are we ready for tomorrow, Mr. Adam? Yes, sir. We are ready tomorrow. Um, should I have it on? Oh, yes, you could. Um, we're socially distanced, by the way. Okay. <laughs> so um, as you can see, it's absolutely important to to be socially distanced um, in, in the process of making uh, yeah, but Thank you very much yes. uh, for inviting me over. And thanks to your uh, viewers. We are indeed ready, of course, in every setup in any system design and implementation. Uh, you keep working on it until you get to the very final minutes. Mm. Uh, we have done all that we have to do. We've done, uh, fixed all the infrastructure. Uh, the partition walls have been set up. The test labs are all in place. Uh, the air conditioning that should, mm. the air conditioning should, that should be uh, in place to ensure that the uh, temperature levels required by the machines are set. All that is being tested, and as we speak, people are there uh, doing the test runs, and uh, we're hoping that in the next three hours or uh, two and a half plus, we're ready to roll. I see. Is that early? Yes. So this is midnight? Midnight. One minute after midnight, we open. But I must say that indeed the pl flights are not scheduled to start coming exactly one minute after midnight. Mm -hmm. The earliest flight we're going to have is probably 1 p.m. in the afternoon. 1 p.m. That's tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon. Tomorrow afternoon. That's what what, what flight do you that's expect? That's a charter flight, I think, that's Tolo. Uh, and then the next one will be TAP, which is the uh, Portugal, uh, Portuguese airline. Mm -hmm. That'll be about 2 p.m. Okay, I mean, so clearly a lot, a lot happening at the airport currently, trying to make sure that everything is uh, brisk. And a lot has been going on for the past uh, several weeks. Uh, the planning took place. Uh, the design came up. Uh, procurement of equipment, installation, all that has gone on over the last several weeks. The last two weeks have been intensive. Uh, 24 hours, seven days a week. We've done that for at least two weeks. Okay, two weeks yes. of testing. Uh, not the testing. Of, uh, of trying to run the protocols, exactly. so, so to do a simulation, trying to make sure that dry run of, of okay. everything else. Okay. And how has that gone? What is that telling you in terms of how r rigorous the process is? Well, it's a very serious exercise, and uh, this is about the health and safety of Ghanaians, and we're trying to make sure that uh, we don't miss anything in, in uh, getting any patient to carry the virus to Ghana. So we have to make sure we test everything accurately, uh, precisely, uh, before we allow them to the country. There's a key concern that comes up as seen, because, I mean, can you imagine the number of people who are stuck out there just yearning to return? Yeah. Um, there's a the concern about traffic, the volumes, and the, the protocols that they have to go through to the end before they get the results. Um, do we have enough logistics, equipment to cater for this traffic that you're anticipating? Yes, indeed, we do have enough logistics. Um, as I said, the plan has been accurately done. Uh, when you come up to the Terminal 3 arrival, we've got some uh, uh, arrival uh, session has been divided into two. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a north wing and a uh, south wing, all on Terminal 3. And then we have about 35, not about, we have 35 booths down south, 35 up north, where we can have 35 people sitting in each of those booths. Mm -hmm. It takes just about two minutes to uh, get a sample out of them. And then there's a runner who carries the sample to the testing lab, where it will be done. Uh, by that time, the passenger would have disembarked and gone down uh, the stair escalator, uh, ready to uh, approach the port health officials, and then move on further to immigration before they come out and pick up their, their, their baggage. All that should happen within a matter of 15, 30 minutes maximum. Oh, from the time that you go off, get off the plane to the time that you exit? The shortest period uh, over which you get your results will be 12 minutes. Mm. But the uh, longest will be about 30 minutes. We're hoping that within uh, 30 minutes you'll be ready to pick your baggage and also get your results. Well, okay. Uh, let's go through the uh, pro processes as the president spelled out yesterday and then today as uh, some clarity. Uh, before you bought a plane anywhere else in the world tonight, if you're listening, you first need a PCR test. Okay. And do this within a 
uh, 72 hours of your flight to Ghana. Yes. Correct. Correct. Okay. The second leg of the question then is, when you arrive in Ghana, that additional test you do in Ghana, which is mandatory, yes. is it only for those who didn't do the PCR test in the last 72 hours, or regardless of whether you've done it or not, you still have to do the mandatory? You still have to do it. This is a policy in Ghana. You know, as you said in your introductory remarks, uh, most of the, uh, the experiences come from people bringing the disease into Ghana. Mm. And we do not want this to reoccur. The president made that very, very clear. And so when you go to purchase a ticket and then uh, embark on an aircraft and come to Ghana, you should have evidence of the PCR having been conducted out there. Mm. And once you have that evidence, then you get on the aircraft. All the protocols will be observed on the aircraft with your uh, face mask and everything. And then when you arrive here, you must have evidence of that before we allow you into the country. Okay. It's mandatory. And you must show this and somebody must verify that this is authentic. I guess then the question about... It is about the duty of the airlines to do that. From the point of origin? Exactly so. Okay, so if you can't verify an airline, don't allow the person into the flight? No. Okay. When you allow them on the flight, you allow them to come to Ghana, you penalize them now. And that's an important point. Yesterday the president said, for airlines that fail to comply, there'll be sanctions. What sanctions are they likely to face? Well, they're going to charge a fee that's been negotiated between the uh, Civil Aviation Authority, airport company, and the airlines. Okay, so the airlines who pay this fee, they'll know exactly. this up front. Yeah. Um, let's also get to talk a bit about the, the test, because I get this is important for people who are arriving into the country. Tonight, we've been speaking to Dr. Kofi Bonner, who is the senior virologist research uh, at Noguchi Memorial Institute. Yeah. Okay, and this is an important point he made about the, the antigen test, which is a 30 minutes one that you, we're going to do. Mm -hmm. He says the PCR test, it calls it the gold standard. Mm -hmm. The antigen test with the 30 minutes, it's sort of the less inferior quality. And he says in the uh, profession, science profession, Noguchi, more than half of those who do the antigen test, the results are more reliable, more than half of that. That clearly must be something that should be of concern to you. Uh, it is of concern to us, but I, I must emphasize this, that to really get the exact explanation on this matter, mm -hmm. you have to speak to the, uh, the experts, the yeah. medical officials. And that was made very clear this morning by the Deputy Minister for Health, Dr. Okuboy. Uh, it's not a regular antigen test. It's superior to that. It gives us about 99% accuracy. It's very specific. It looks out for the virus, and, and uh, it's able to tell whether you actually have it or not. Mm -hmm. So it's not the ordinary antigen test that they refer to. It's more or less, I would say, between you and I, uh, uh, layman's point of view, that's, uh, it's a wild guess, whether you have it or do not have it. So that we have to get the experts to explain to you. It's not just an ordinary antigen test. That's what I must say. Okay. The, the, for that test, which is, you say it's not ordinary, I mean, but the, I guess the health experts um, say the PCR test is more reliable. Why can't that be enough if you've had it for 72 hours? Because at the turnaround time, it's too small. Well, uh, uh, it, every country depends on its policies. Mm -hmm. And this is why we've been advised by the health uh, professionals to adopt as a policy for Ghana. And that's the decision for us. I was just trying to imagine why we probably did it. It was a fear that between the 72 hours and the time you arrived, you possibly could have also been exposed. I'm very clear that all those assessments were done by the health professionals, and that's the decision we've arrived on, and that's the way it's going to be. For those who turn out to be positive on arrival, yes. what's the protocol? Would there be self-quarantine for 14 days? Uh, by the time you conduct the test and get down and get results from the uh, port health officials, There'll be the experts there to guide you over to uh, a booth, a special booth that's been built for those who are going to come up with the positive results. Mm -hmm. And then they'll be uh, taken up by the professionals, whether it's going to be counseling or whether it's going to be guided into treatment centers. All that's been determined by the Port Health officials and the Ghana Health Service. Will they be asked to say, stay in a hotel, for example, for the Not a hotel anymore, they go straight for a treatment center. Because we'll be determined that it is positive. So there's no need to send them to a hotel and do another test. You go straight to a treatment center, okay. from what I understand. So this is important. If you're listening to us tonight and you're arriving, you want to come into Ghana from tomorrow. If you arrive and you test positive, regardless of your PCR test, you will be required to go to a treatment center. And we know the treatment takes anywhere between 14 to 21 days. And so you should be prepared uh, for that. Uh, to happen. That could be a major disruption to people's lives. It, it well, the whole disease has been a disruption to our lives. Nobody wanted the disease here. Mm. Nobody wanted the virus, and we're all faced with it. So, 
You're better off going out there and getting treated than sitting out and infecting other people and perhaps losing your own life. Let's talk about the cost of this, because this is $150. That's, that's a lot of money. It's a very simple thing to look at. You said it yourself, 14 days in quarantine, times whatever the rate is going to be for a hotel, $70 at least, mm -hmm. times 40 days, what does it come to? That's a guess that we all should know. 70 times 14 is giving us something over $200. That's against $150. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's bearable. If you speak against to... Against loss of life and against loss of life of other people that you're infecting, it's something that we need to work on. Dr. Kofi Bonio of the senior researcher at um, Noguchi, we asked the question, the antigen test which, we, which, which we're, we're going to do, um, th that takes 30 minutes, how much does it cost? He said anything between 10 to $20. So 150 if we take his word we for it. We said it before, it's not an antigen test. You said it's an enhanced form of this? Yes. 99% accuracy PCR. Yeah. But, 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 but what Noguchi is you, and this is Noguchi is our, you know what I'm talking about, Noguchi is our This is test our has been primary. certified by Noguchi yes. to be 99% accurate. And Noguchi says it costs 100, 10 to $20. That's not what we got from them. All these numbers came out of the Noguchi experts advising us what to do. But Dr. Bonny is a senior researcher there. You know what well, I mean? Well, we've got a director of the Noguchi who's been with us all along. But don't you think it's at least, if that is the case... It's been decided. I'm going to be very frank with you. It's been decided and I'm not here to debate on the policy anymore. I mean, for those who are listening, you know, for, you put yourself in the shoes of the guy who's been stranded for so long. You want to go back this money. You want to go back and be in quarantine for 14 days and when you detect it to be uh, positive, then you go for treatment? Is that what we want? Mm. Let's live with this. Otherwise, we have to close the airport down again and go through what we've gone through the past uh, four or five months. I don't think it's acceptable. I'm just curious. Compare with other countries. Mm -hmm. You go to Zimbabwe, $210. At the airport? At the airport. Go to uh, Austria, 190 euros. Go to UK, 150 pounds. And so on and so forth. Other countries, you may pay China, $150, uh, but it takes you six hours. All these things have been uh, compared with what we've arrived on, and that's what we're going to, to, to adopt as a nation. Those who ask for, get to the airport and say, I'm sorry, I, I, can't, I can't cough up 150 now. You can't get on the, air fly, uh, the aircraft when you're coming to Ghana unless you accept these protocols. It's very clear. The airline will be responsible. If you get here, you say you will subject yourself to the test. Then this is important, again, if you're listening. Do not get onto the aircraft if you don't have $150 to pay for the test when you arrive locally. That's your point you're making to them. Indeed, you're advised to pay before get on. That's what the airline is supposed to do. Okay. You're supposed to pay electronically, that's the preferred option of paying before you get on the flight. This is an important point. So you would not pay when you arrive. The air airlines are supposed to charge you up front before you board. Exactly so. So possibly it's going to be part of your fee that you pay to the airlines. Well, that's what it's been decided on. You arrange how best to get it done. May not be your ticket price, but you have to pay up there and show evidence of it before you get here. Goodness me. Um, <laughs> this is this is a tough one. I mean, for for those who were stranded. I mean, just spare a thought for them. I mean, those who were stranded for so long. I'm pretty sure you have family relatives Eric, who have been telling you all the, Eric, all the years. Think, that Eric, this is a policy of government. We've gone through several weeks of debate on this. We've said so many different things, mm -hmm. and this is what we've arrived at. And, and this is the way we're going to try and manage it. Otherwise, you close down the airport. Let's talk about the preparedness of the airlines themselves for tomorrow. Um, I know there have been meetings planned. Yes. How prepared are they? I know from your end, Civil Aviation Authority, Ghana Airports Company, from what we heard today, for preparedness. What about the other side? Are they prepared for this? You're talking about airlines or the operators? Operators. The operators. Uh, Ghana Airports uh, has been well prepared. In fact, we've had experience of uh, uh, conducting uh, passengers through evacuation uh, uh, flights, especially emergency flights. And so we've gone through that process and been able to. Uh, carry ourselves through in a manner that we can handle those passages when they come on. So this is just an enhanced version of it uh, because of the uh, high volume of num uh, passages who will come through the airport. So we get 300 uh, passages coming in over a matter of about uh, two hours or three hours we're able to process them without any problem. If we're going to have uh, the regular flights where we might have maximum peak time about 1,200 passages, mm -hmm. we can handle that within a matter of two hours. A matter of two hours? Yes. The airlines, though, I mean, I just chanced on the document just before we came on air. 
um, uh, from the Ghana Civil Liberation Authority uh, talking about the preparedness towards restarting the operations. And this is a letter that was written on the 26th of August 2020. And was asking for a meeting uh, with all the other stakeholders, Ghana Airports Company, all aircraft operators. And this was for Tuesday, 2nd September um, f at 10 hours 2020 to discuss preparedness towards a reopening. And my question, obviously, you could see, I'm sure you have a copy of this. My question, obviously, is um, signed by the, by the head of the, of the Aviation Authority. My question, obviously, is we are opening this on the 1st of September, mm -hmm. but they're now fixing a meeting to actually have a proper conversation about preparedness with the flight operators on the 2nd of September. No, we've gone past this. Okay. Remember, in our effort to determine what did was going to be best for us, we're doing all the planning and assessing all the options available to us. And in that process, we plan different dates. Uh, this was one of them until we finally arrived at the position where we know we're adequately prepared to be able to handle it. So this really, this has been superseded. But, but, but the meeting date was set for the 2nd of, of September. Um, what's the date of the letter? The date, the date is 26th of August. What's the date today? But the date for the what's meeting. What's the date today? The, the, today's date is 31st. That's what I'm saying. What was done was intended to continue to plan as if we're not sure when we're going to get it done. Okay. And as of uh, uh, 27, 28th, we're sure what we're going to do. Okay, so 27, 28th so this will of August. Yes. And my question is whether this meeting has been had. No, this will not happen. We've had meetings with them. I've had at least uh, three meetings with the airlines in my mm -hmm. office. Uh, I'm sure Civil Aviation Authority have had their own uh, encounter with them, and so has the Ghana Airport Company. This was meant uh, to meet them because we're not so sure when we're going to open. So mm -hmm. we have to change that when we're sure that we had the right equipment, the devices to be able to do the test. We could go through the whole simulation process and uh, get ourselves ready to accept the passengers into the country. Okay. So this is this is superseded. I ask this because, and I have it on authority from some of the air, uh, flight operators, but they, some of them, raise concerns. The final authority for Civil Aviation Authority is not Mr. Aqua, it's, it's the Director General, Mr. Uh, Kreku. Okay. So this is part of the internal planning process, but it's been superseded by the Director General. And he's issued a nota. I, I, I get that. Uh, my, my question, the question this raises is whether the adequate meetings have been held to get them to Yes, prepare. we have had several meetings, as I said. I've had at least three meetings with them in my office. The airport, flight operators. Airport company has had at least three meetings with them. Uh, and I think Civil Aviation Authority, Port Health, have also been part of that. Will this meeting happen, though? Or there's no other meeting that's going to happen? No, no, there's no meeting for any meeting, except for briefing notes. So the meeting to decide on options or to decide on ideas from them, it's been decided, policy has been uh, uh, issued, and we're ready to operate. The domestic airlines, um, Africa uh, World, and etc., who they've already been operating, yes. I mean, locally. Uh, and international airlines, uh, obviously, will now be joining the party, I guess, so to speak, from tomorrow. Um, the, the adequate preparations for the whole host of the airlines that we have, you use our, our ports currently. Mm. All of them are adequately briefed to start tomorrow. They have all been part of the meetings. And I must say for the domestic airlines, they've been doing this for a while now. For a while now. Yeah. yeah. I think they started from uh, first May. And we've uh, uh, said their operations have been quite good. Mm. OK. I mean, they, they, they asked me to put the to you, though. I mean, a few other, other things that um, they had concerns about, including the, the, the feeling that um, they need some more, I guess, interaction from your end to get them, to get them ready. And, and they, they, they quote the point that there's an emergency meeting tonight on, on, ahead of I, tomorrow. I, I, I don't know where you're getting this from, but let me tell you this. The airlines have been the ones who have given me ideas on protocols that they've received from their mm -hmm. countries. Mm -hmm. Some of them argue that they've been ready in their home countries for a long time. Mm -hmm. They've been asking for the airports to open way back before we even decided as government. Mm -hmm. So really, anybody could get up any day and say, let's have a meeting, you keep having meetings, uh, for meetings or for meetings. But they've been coming with what pertains in their home countries, and the situation has been okay by them. So I don't know what, uh, what we're referring to now, uh, if we're going to have a meeting again tomorrow, uh, next tomorrow, and so on and so forth. It's not going to help us. We've decided on policy, uh, based on all the groundwork that's gone on, all the debates that's gone on within government sector. That's what we've arrived at, and that's what we're going to go with. The those who are going to arrive in the country, I know the other countries, they've restricted travel if you want to travel to, say, UK, it's not for 
all forms of travel. There's some particular types of travel. So if you go to go tourism, for example, they haven't opened that yet. You have to probably do, if you go to do medicals, they are, they are allowing you to travel in. For us, is it all across the board travel or there are particular types that you cannot do for now? No, for, for now, I'd like to say it's for all kinds of travel. Okay. We've not distinguished between you coming as a tourist or coming in uh, for business or coming in to uh, uh, deliver a lecture somewhere. As far as I'm concerned, it's for all travels. All travels uh, into Ghana, we're not limiting it at all. I mean, <coughs> I mean, don't be advised otherwise. Un until you're advised otherwise. Yes. But you don't think that possibly there is limited a bit now and, and do it gra scale up gradually? Well, I think we are, we are uh, adhering to protocols in Ghana now. Mm -hmm. The disinfection, the face masks, the social distancing is going on in all kinds of uh, social settings in Ghana. Mm -hmm. So we expect that anybody who's coming in to attend a funeral, uh, to go for a wedding, uh, to go to church, all those things have been announced by the president where we still uh, locked down, you're not supposed to go to clubs and things of that sort. So when you come in, say you come as a tourist, you should know that you're not going to the club. There's not going to be any uh, open uh, dancing anywhere. Uh, you're not coming for sports to the level that we expected to go to the stadium and, and see the big crowd and go through. So all those things that are being restricted are still being held as uh, stated by the president in the country. Okay. Um, do you, when do you expect our, our full traffic to pick up? The traffic that we had before we shut down, when do you expect everything to be full steam? I, I, from what you said, 1 o'clock, first flight is arriving, but this is going to be gradual. No, you're not going to have all your flights mm. starting immediately. When, when do you expect all this to pick up? Well, I, 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 I rather I speak to what I, I hope for okay. than what I expect to happen. Uh, but uh, if you ask for what we expect to happen, I think we can only find that out by the end of the week. Uh, by Sunday, usually between Friday and Sunday, so that's when we have the peak uh, numbers. So we'll see by the weekend what numbers have come through, and then we can take a guess as to whether that's going to be uh, the numbers uh, going forward. Or it's going to be a scale-up sort of situation. Okay. The, I'm curious to know this. We've shut the airport since March. Correct. That is huge. That will leave a huge revenue hole mm. in in your pocket. But invariably, I pocket as my pocket as well because yeah. of course this is a huge revenue. Mm. We took a loan to build yes. and expand. Yes. How much of a hole is there? Since March? Oh, it's been a big hole. It's been over 500 million cities that we've experienced. 500 million cities? Yes. yes. Over the period since March? Period, yes. That we've lost? Yes. Hmm. It's a lot. It's been a lot. We've counted all the passengers who, were, who would have paid their air passenger service charge. We've counted all the aircraft that would have paid for the London fees and overflight fees and things like that. So all that has related to quite a significant amount of money. How, how much of an impact is that going to have on your operations going forward? Well, it's already hard on our pressures. Uh, we've been constrained in so many ways. All the administrative expenses and the operational uh, revenue that we needed to be able to pay for those costs. Uh, we've gone without that. Uh, we've had to stagger the way that uh, workers come to, to work, except when we get uh, emergency flights, really don't bring all of them on board. So it's been quite a, a, a hefty hit on us. But I must say that the two agencies, Civil Aviation and Airport Company, have done quite well not laying anybody off. We maintain them, uh, the salaries that they've been earning. Uh, we thank the government for having come up for the uh, support. Uh, it's a bailout that was uh, arranged by the Minister of uh, Finance through CBG, and that's what the access to try and uh, keep us going. Indeed, we hope that, uh, not that we hope, but we thought we'd go through this problem toward the end of the year. But uh, as we, we know now, we're hoping by uh, end of September we see some revenue coming in in good numbers. I need to ask this, was this whole a factor in reopening? I'm not sure I understand you. Because you're, I mean, you're bleeding cash. I'm just wondering oh, whether as, in, as in making the decision we're, we're, to reopen. We're compelled? Yes. Because, no, 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 no. The health and the protocols and how ready we are to contain the virus. The, the, the financial considerations were not in it? Oh, that we cannot put against the lives of Ghanaians. Hmm. Well, 500 million is a lot of money well, for a country like that. Like that's Ghana, what was projected as I have to get the exact figures by the time I go back tomorrow morning to know exactly what the final one was. Okay. Yeah. I mean, th this is a lot to, I guess, digest. And if you're just joining us, wherever you are tonight, um, I, I guess the biggest takeaway is if you are flying to this country, a few things you need to bear in mind. In fact, the $150 that I know has become an issue. The minister says you have to pay before you arrive. The airlines are supposed to take that 
uh, from you before you board your flight into Ghana, you should be prepared if you test positive here, regardless of your PCR test. Um, uh, and asking the question about PCR test being superior to the one we are doing for the 30 minutes, but it says that's a government policy. You simply have to stick by it. Or, as they say, you, you, you cannot arrive in Ghana because it's going to be strictly enforced. Um, and so make sure that you pay that before you arrive. The airlines is going to face, they're going to face sanctions, um, including um, paying fees, fines, if they fail to uh, adhere to the protocols. I, said, I, wonder, I wonder whether they, I wonder whether they would determine exactly how much fine the airlines will, will, will bear. Well, I, uh, it was being worked on uh, before I left the office. I haven't got the final figure yet. Mm, OK. You want to stay with me? When I return from this break, um, Mr. Joseph Ada is also the man who is leading this government, one of government's ambitious plans to turn Ghana into an aviation hub. Um, and so we cannot have him here and not talk about that ambition. It is part of that ambition that we've heard that we're going to be establishing an airport in Cape Coast, by the way. He will talk to us about that also. And we'll look at the airport. I've heard somewhere that we want to invest some three billion dollars to expand the aviation infrastructure in this country. That is also a very ambitious one, all part of creating an aviation hub. Stay with me. You're still live here on PM Express. My guest tonight is the aviation minister, Mr. Joe Savada. Of course, he is uh, he's on the cusp of a very important. Uh, day in his in his, uh, his life as a minister, the reopening of the Kotoka International Airport, which has been shut since March. Uh, there's a lot that's going to happen tomorrow that uh, we're trying to get him to clarify. Um, earlier, we spoke about the concern that some of the uh, you know airline operators had about you know getting to know a bit more. I've seen a, a tweet <coughs> I want to read to him. This is from uh, Sean Mendes. He is the chief operating officer of what. Um, with the Africa World Alliance, and he says, um, Mr. Ada, hello, we have heard the news, but at this time we have not received any official notification from GCAA regarding the protocols for Ghanaian Airlines. The points so far all deal with foreign carriers. Therefore, our international flights remain suspended until further notice. We are meeting with GCAA later today to discuss further. No further. Well, I'm surprised at that. I think the the protocols for the domestic airlines are already invoked, they're being applied. Mm. Uh, if it's talking about them going to Nigeria or to Sierra Leone or Liberia, uh, would have to apply just like any other international airline. I don't know what's going to be special about them. Uh, once they leave the borders of this country, they're international. So I don't think there's going to be anything special for them to do. If they go to Liberia or Nigeria and they're bringing passengers to the country, all these same protocols will apply. They have to bring in passengers who have negative certificates, they have to bring in passengers uh, who will be subjected to the test, and if they bring passengers who don't have the negative certificate, they will be subjected to penalties. So it's standard. But I, I will check into that tomorrow. Uh, as of 8.30 this morning, when I was heading for the press conference, all, all of the notices had been served to them. Mm. Uh, I'm not so sure he really needs a special one uh, for the domestic operations. If he's going international, as I said, all the other things apply. Like KLM, British Airways, if they're going uh, from any other country coming to Ghana, same thing will happen if Africa World goes to Guinea and they come to Ghana. Yeah, but it, but the fundamental point you're making is that they are not informed. International airlines, yes, checked, but for for those who operate domestic, go international, or international. When it comes to that, it's as simple as that. But if that's the case, then they should have been, they should have known, but they don't know. The, it's usually shared to all of them. I, I will check onto that and see uh, why they haven't been served. If it's assumed that uh, in plan to go international, automatically. Uh, they're covered under that, but it will be very clear to make sure they get it. Okay, I, I mean, it's a question I had coming from one a person who is uh, want to want to come into Ghana. He's asking peak periods mm -hmm. um, because of the traffic that you're expecting yeah. and all the protocols you need to go through. Yeah. That you say anything between ten to thirty minutes, you could actually leave in fifteen minutes. Correct. But peak periods. What he wants to know what is the protocol for peak periods? Peak periods will depend first. First of all, let me say that peak periods will look at them as being a period within which we have uh, three, four, five, or six aircraft landing at the same mm -hmm. time. Uh, I think that usually happens within a matter of uh, one and a half, two hours. Mm -hmm. If your aircraft comes first, you'll be able to get a, uh, shall we say, 30 minute uh, waiting period and get out of the airport. But if you come, uh, maybe second or third or so, the others will be ahead of you. We're hoping that as we go through the 20, 30 minute process, you also uh, stay that long. 
But if it, it, it's a little slow, maybe because of something un, unanticipated, then that's when you stay longer than that. Otherwise, we expect a smooth flow. As I said, we're going to have a total of 70 booths, mm -hmm. 35 to the south side, 35 to the north side. And all of those passengers just come, two minutes, sit down, get the specimens taken. The runners will take the specimen to the testing center. You go out and, and, and by the time you get to Port Health, the results are down there. You go through immigration, come out, uh, go through customs with your baggage, and you're gone. Mm. So it's going to be smooth. I don't see them standing waiting there for too long. But any maximum waiting period in any airport, uh, in, uh, airport will probably be maximum one and a half hours mm. if you must wait that long. Um, I have a quick question on the, um, how much you've lost over the period um, before we move on to other things. Quite a huge figure you mentioned earlier. Are we, what is the plan to make that up? Well, uh, first of all, let me, let me uh, correct that because what I said was what we had uh, estimated would lose uh, from April to end of the year, the, about the 500 plus uh, million cities that I was talking about. But now that we're going to uh, start operating from September at first, will be lower than that. Mm. So we have to cut off about some four months of that. And that will give us something maybe in the neighborhood of uh, 300, 400 million or so. Uh, cities. Cities, correct. As to uh, how to make up for that, what is lost is lost. We're not going to gain that. Uh, so we're not going to go in and double charge somebody just because we lost revenue. No. Flights didn't come in, passengers didn't come in, you have no revenue, it's gone. So what we'll try to do is, you know, add on more, more activities and bring in more uh, services in other areas where people patronize a lot more than uh, they've done in the past, but that's uh, after uh, whoever is coming to decide whether they're going to buy things more than they bought or whether they're going to patronize any other service. As we speak now, I don't see how we can quickly get those services uh, introduced within this period. So it's going to be a very slow trickle of revenue coming to the country hmm. from now to the end of the year. Let's move to other things. You've been accused, and recently by John Mahama, uh, the NDC flag bearer, that you are selling off our airport assets, including the beautiful Kutuka International Airport in, in our background. It's really unfortunate that uh, a former president who sat and supervised the construction of a, of a terminal building that should have cost us $161 billion. And so it was, should cost us? It should have cost us $161 billion. What the basis one. of that is? It's a report that was uh, undertaken to show that is the cost of the terminal, $165 million. Report done by commission by yourself? Not by ourselves, but at the time that they were uh, planning to construct us. How did it go up to $275 million? We do not know. And in fact, if you add all the other things that they did in addition to that, it came to rough about $400 million. And he was, was surprised, I was surprised that he came with uh, four, what, what did he say, about uh, $600 million that he said they invested in there. He didn't explain where that investment went to, what infrastructure did they spend the money on. It, if anybody should be talking about that investment, it shouldn't be him at all. But everybody has come up and complained about the cost of this uh, terminal building, which should not be more than $161, $170 million. You go over $275 million, you shouldn't be talking about that. But anyway, that, that's gone. We've incurred that money as to whether... But, it, but I, I'm sorry. Let, let me make this point. It's very, very it's important. important I'll come back to that because it, it's a yes, very important question, yes. question to ask on what you said earlier. Yeah, because let me ask it before you move on there. Because you said the amount we spend on the airport is bloated. Far bloated right. than we expected. If that's the case, it is financial law to the state. Yes, that's what it is. But if, if that's the case, why aren't you prosecuting people? Well, you have to uh, get all those uh, people to come and participate, all those uh, uh, people who are part of it. But let me explain something to you. It's come up in the public domain that the Turkish company that was involved in it, they uh, said somewhere that about $240 million was what was added onto that. $120 million went one way, another $120 went $20 million went another way. Now, these are things you have to investigate deeply and get those results. You have four up. years. Yes. Uh, four years? Four years is not when you really get all the evidence before you. Okay? All I'm saying is that you shouldn't even be talking about uh, the cost of a, a terminal building that should be one sixty eight one million dollars You shouldn't be talking about that as a former president who sat and saw that happen. Secondly, if you're looking at uh, managing the airport, you don't go back and, and base yourself on something that doesn't exist as a document signed to or, or authorized by government that is a negotiated document that we're going to use to sell the airport. There's a or, tough super deal which... There's no deal whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Let me make this very clear to viewers. We have not entered into negotiations in any way at all with TAF or SUMA. I emphasize, there's no sale of any airport 
no privatization of any airport, no management control of any sort. What we've gone through is simply expressions of interest from a Turkish consortium of uh, Suma, which is into civil works, and TAF, which is to, into management of airports, who are planning to come and be in Ghana, help us to expand our, our aviation infrastructure to attain the vision of the president, which is to make it the hub in the West African sub-region. They see Ghana as a good place to do business. Uh, they think we're managing the economy well. They're excited about the opportunities in Africa. They think Ghana is the place where they can uh, anchor in and then move on to other parts so of the country. So do what exactly? Let me, to help us expand the infrastructure, to help expand the number of airlines that, that will come into Ghana, to help us uh, increase the number of passenger flow that will come through Ghana, all the things that involve making aviation relevant to the development of this na nation. But not to take over them right now. Let me get to the point. The point is that they say, look, we can come and work with you. Help introduce certain things. You want to set up what we call ATO, Aviation Training Organization, to be able to train pilots, to train carbon crew, engineers, and so on and so forth. We can help you develop that. We can help you put together what we call an MRO, Maintenance Repair uh, Overhaul Facility, which doesn't exist. Those two, ATO, MRO, do not exist anywhere in Western Central Africa. Mm. They find Ghana being a good place where they can do that. We can help construct that as a partnership to get us to provide the additional jobs and services that we need in this country. There's no big cargo uh, facility in Ghana. They're prepared to help that happen. There's no real major revenue source to Ghana in terms of modern state-of-the-art uh, car parks that should be a major revenue earner for the airport company. That's standard these days. We don't have that. We're not able to invest on that because most of the money is going to service the debt that uh, the Jomama government uh, locked us in and committed the air passenger service charge into an escrow. You said they locked you in, but they back. built a fascinating, you, 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 fascinating that re revenue. It could have been cheaper. Re revenue. It could have been cheaper. You, you, you did not have to. But go I put that question to you. It's cheaper. Have, that's what I'm telling you. You haven't prosecuted you didn't, anybody. You did not have it's an allegation that you can prove. It's not an allegation. It's not an allegation. But if it's not, you why did, don't you prosecute somebody? If you negotiated well, you did not have to lock in the air passenger service charge. But what, have they done anything wrong? Have they done anything wrong? Yes, they've done something wrong. So prosecute them. Well, I'm not a lawyer for now, but I'll tell you that something will come up. I, you're going to be prosecuted. Well, I didn't say prosecute, but something will come up. I mean, after four years, with three months on election... You did not have to spend that much money on this terminal budget. Simple matter. But, but why, should I, why should I take that when it is taxpayers' money involved and the government that says this is bloated still doesn't want to go ahead? I do get my money from you or prosecute somebody for it. We've got a, you have to go through an audit process, which we've just completed. Mm. That's come up for review. Until you're through with that and give over to the Attorney General to act on, you cannot really go to court. So you expect that to happen? That's, ha that's happened now. We've got a report that we reviewed and we'll uh, hand over to the right authorities. Do you expect a prosecution at the end of this? I cannot say I will be advised by the lawyers. Okay. The airport in... Uh, I did not conclude the matter on the sale or privatization. Okay. What I wanted to say to the hearing of Ghanaians is that we're looking to expand the infrastructure to improve the services in Ghana, to make it a, an attractive place for the whole nation by having a partnership. Partnership in which no direct management would come from any foreign entity. The airport management as it is, the board as it is, the staff as they are would remain that way. Indeed, there will be opportunities for those staff members and management personnel to move on into special purpose vehicles, if that's what we must resort to, to get, for instance, the car park company set up, to get a vision training organization set up, to get MRO set up, cargo village set up. This will be opportunities for jobs, for businesses, where senior management people can move on and manage those things. So nobody's going to come and lay anybody off. Nobody's going to come in and uh, set up any airport, take over its management, and so on. That's not going to happen at all, never. And I must conclude on this point. We have not even written to TAF or SUMA to come for any negotiation. These documents that are floating about are simple expressions of interest that they brought, proposals that they're offering that they would want to engage us on, until you got the approval, which is now what I have. I have the you have the approval? I have the approval from cabinet in March to engage. To engage means to bring them to the table and negotiate. But before you do that, I have to contact the board, let the board know what we have to do, I agree on the roadmap, get a team to engage them, and also decide for ourselves what it is that we're going to set as benchmarks, mm -hmm. key performance indicators, before we engage them. That will put before the board. And these are documents that have leaked, that have not even been discuss at all. And we had to write to them to come. We've not written to them. They've not been invited. 
So these documents are not legal documents. They're not agreements of any sort. They're not documents that we need to uh, send to anybody and tell them this is what is going to happen. I've heard things about 63%, uh, top smash. Oh, these are ideas that they threw about that I don't even want to look at. Mm -hmm. So what is the status idea. of this conversation as of tonight? We are now to write to them, but we must set up the team which will comprise the ministry, the board, reps, the management and union to, to sit and agree on a roadmap which I've developed for them and, and set up the key performance indicators, service level agreements before we invite the company to come. I have, a, be invited to I have a direct question. So you're saying categorically that all these negotiations that we're having, Ghana Airport Company will in the future remain 100% owned by the state, by Ghana Airport Company. The main setup of the company will be 100%. Any subsidiaries that will be set up based on partnership arrangements could be part Ghanaian owned, part foreign owned. As we speak today, we've got so examples. We're going to dilute. We've got examples. No, hold on. We're not diluting at all. Mm. We've got the Ghana Airport Company exists as it is now, 100%. Okay? We've got subsidiary like Seva, which is providing a catering service. Mm. It's a strategic partnership okay. that we own shares in there. We've got Aviance. Aviance. So those partners. are the ones that you would Similar ones that we're setting up with this company, okay. Tava Suma. Let's talk about the Cape Coast Airport. Um, the president, in an interview before the launch of the manifesto, said that your ministry was doing a lot of work in trying to assess um, feasibility yes. for Cape Coast. And he actually even mentioned one for Eastern Region as well. Yes. Correct. Let's talk about the Cape Coast one. The feasibility, was it done? Yes, it's been done. You have it, a document. It, it needs to be updated. It's been done. We need to update it. Uh, that will always be done when the uh, developers When was in. it done? Uh, it was done uh, several years ago. I have to look at the date. But Seven days ago? Several years ago. Oh, goodness me. So yes. we don't have one to back the recent announcement? You do the baseline and set it up for any developer who comes, takes it up and goes to do the Seven years ago, that's John Mohammed's I said several. I didn't say seven, seven years. Oh, several years yes, ago. Yes, about three, four years but ago. That, but that was not done by this government? Oh, no, it was done much, much earlier. By which government? Well, the first one was done by, uh, I think, what, 1998, 1999 or so. Yeah. They so had on the table for investors to come and pick and, and, and look at it go and validate, and then decide on what they want to do. So before the manifesto launch, your government had not done a feasibility study for Cape Coast? No, we've, we've done baseline work for all the potential airports in the country. What is baseline work? Baseline basically means that you look at the land, uh, how much uh, you would use, the runway type of runway you would have, type of terminal building, passenger flow. Those are basic items that you need to have on the table before you, you, you engage in a partner. Okay. It costs a lot to go do all those feasibility studies, and that we don't always have the money, the ministries to do that. Yeah, I mean, but, but the important point is, the president said in the interview that you were doing feasibility studies. That's, that is categorically not true. Oh, yes. The feasibility studies mean getting the data. I've been out there with my team. We've picked up all the basic data we need. The full feasibility study as a complete report is different from picking all the data that will build into a feasibility study. So the, the work that you did was what exactly? The work we did was to go uh, acquiring the land, agree on the space. Oh, we acquired the land? Employers' requirements that are required to build the airport. These are all the things we do. Sorry, so you have, you have acquired the land for the airport? Yes. Already? Where? It's between, uh, I don't remember the name of the community, it's between Commander and Shama. We paid for this? We paid uh, for the land? We, it, it's a partnership thing. Okay, between? Somebody owned the land or uh, traditional, I can't remember the details, but it's owned. And it's going to be shared by the state. Okay. So is that the only work you did in terms of acquiring the land? Looking at the suitability of the location? I told you all the things that go into what we call employers' requirements. Employers? The requirements. Meaning all the things that we want anybody to take on board when they're uh, putting together their commercial contract. For the airport? For the airport. Okay. We've got all those items. Mm -hmm. Which is the type of runway, the terminal building, the flow, all the services, everything. Those, those things are there. How much would it cost us to build the airport? I wouldn't know, but it would depend on the person who would come and how big he wants it to be. It could range anywhere from $50 million, uh, $60 million to $100 or something million. Dollars. Depends on the size of it. So by the time that we were announcing the airport, you didn't know the cost? Oh, you wouldn't know the final cost, no. Yeah, but how do you do that? How do you announce a big project? You would never know the, know the, the total cost of any big project. You but that's what feasibility studies do. They tell you a lot. We, uh, I'm telling cost, you that what we did viability. Was, so have I, you done a viability assessment? I, you are getting me to repeat myself. I'm just asking about have we done a viability I'm talking assessment? About the, 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 the developer will have to come and do it. So we don't have a viability assessment? We cannot go about doing everything for partners who come and... So as of today, you don't know whether it is commercially viable to have an airport in Cape Coast or not? All the airports you cannot really tell. 
there's always a viability gap on all the airports in Ghana. No airport is viable in Ghana. No well, airport is viable not, in Ghana? Not at all. But the passengers don't go up to those numbers yet. Not of all of them, right? even including today, in the Kotoka International Airport. No airport is viable. That's why the state always picks up the tab, and we cannot continue to do that. Mm. Minister of Finance cannot continue to do that, and also continue to build our schools and build our hospitals and so on and so forth. So all those things are always being picked up. If you want to go and do a purely private venture and look at how uh, uh, viable it is, there has to be a gap that somebody has to meet up because passengers that would really make it viable will go up to millions of uh, passengers. One million, two million passengers. As we said today, you cannot talk more than 200, 300,000 passengers in Tinkus, 400,000, 500,000 uh, passengers in, in see, Tamari mm -hmm. or in uh, Takwari. Mm -hmm. So if you choose to do that, you can limit yourself and then look at the gap that someone has to meet uh, uh, halfway for you to be able to get it done. Um, Mr. Joseph, I'm grateful that you joined me and uh, all the best tomorrow. Very busy day ahead. I don't envy you. Thank all you the best. Me. I hope it goes smoothly. Thank you. Enjoy your evening.